Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are in the world. My name is Anthony Hobley. I'm the Executive Director of Mission Possible at the World Economic Forum. I would like to welcome everyone to the unveiling of the exciting new Mission Possible Partnership at Davos Agenda Week. We are pleased to have such a lineup of great and very relevant speakers to unveil the partnership. The platform launched in 2019 at the UN Climate Action Summit, the, the Mission Possible platform, as a vehicle to deliver the industry decarbonisation blueprint laid out in the Energy Transitions seminal Mission Possible report. The precursor Mission Possible platform has grown from the then 40 to now over 400 companies, along with their customers, suppliers, bankers, shareholders and regulators to forge net zero pathways and the actions necessary to achieve them. The acceleration of the Mission Possible platform to a partnership one year since its formation is a signal that businesses and countries are ready to step up ambition in the race to net zero emissions. We have demonstrated that this is truly mission possible and not mission impossible, although we will continue to do all our own stunts. At the same time, we have outlined the systems change required in a four step process we will apply to accelerate several pathways in the so-called harder to abate sectors. This will require collaboration across business, finance, government and civil society up and down supply chains. The scale of this ambition necessitates a scale up of resources. That is why we are launching this partnership to supercharge this industry decarbonisation and to consign the term harder to abate to the dustbin of history. The Mission Possible Partnership will play a critical role as the conductor of the industry decarbonisation orchestra we have assembled. The Davos Agenda is an important moment in the drumbeat to COP26 in Glasgow, the international climate negotiations in November. And we look forward to working with our partners across sectors and as part of the net zero breakthroughs being pushed by the high level champions to deliver concrete industry decarbonisation commitments run by the World Economic Forum, the Energy Transitions Commission, the Rocky Mountain Institute, and the We Mean Business Coalition, the Mission Possible Partnership will work to decarbonize heavy industry and transport by unifying the critical actors needed to influence and enable industry transformation at speed and scale. Thank you all for taking part and taking the time to join this discussion. With that, I'm gonna hand over to our excellent moderator, Rich Lesser, the CEO of BCG. Rich. Thank you, Anthony. I'm so pleased and excited to be here today. Uh, BCG's partnership with the World Economic Forum on climate topics has been one of our highest priorities over the last few years. And there are two things of particular note for this session. Um, first, just last week, we published a joint forum BCG report called the Supply Chain Opportunity that takes a supply chain perspective on emissions and their abatement. What's really striking is the impact supply chain collaboration can have in promoting action by sharing decarbonization costs and lowering financing hurdles. The report also highlights nine actions CEOs should take to step up their climate ambition, two of which stress the importance of ecosystem action for best practice sharing, policy advocacy, and amplifying demand side commitments. And second, Six months ago, we began supporting Mission Possible on the development of its long-term strategy. This panel represents the true launch of the Mission Possible Partnership, which is dedicated to helping hard to abate sectors accelerate their journeys to a low carbon future. So this is an exciting day. Uh, this launch could not come at a more urgent time given the climate context. We saw an emission reduction of six to 8% in 2020 versus 2019, but for all the wrong reasons. And yet we need a reduction on this order of magnitude every year from now on to reach a Paris compatible emissions trajectory. We need to collaborate to accelerate climate action from every possible angle to meet that challenge. We'll discuss more about the vision and ambition of this partnership shortly, but first I wanna introduce the terrific panelists that are with us today. First is uh, Minister Car Carolina Schmidt. She's the Environment Minister for Chile who previously served as COP25 president and was a driving force behind Chile's renewed climate pledge announced last year, which includes a commitment to peak greenhouse gas emissions by 2025. Dr. M Maria Mendeluce, uh, she's the CEO of We Mean Business that Anthony just 
uh, mentioned. It's a global coalition catalyzing business action and driving policy ambition to accelerate the, next, the net zero transition. Dr. Fatih Birol, uh, he's, he is the executive director of the International Energy Agency. Under Fatih's leadership, the IEA has undertaken its first comprehensive modernization program. It's focused on three pillars, opening the doors of the IEA to include major emerging economies, making the IEA the global hub for clean energy transitions, and broadening the IEA security mandate to include electricity and natural gas as well as oil. Puneet Dalmia, the managing director of Dalmia Bharat, who's long advocated for Dalmia's as well as India's focus on environmental responsibility and climate action. He's positioned the firm to be a global leader across the industries within which they operate. And Mads Nipper, the chief executive officer of Orsted, a leading offshore wind company. Before joining Orsted earlier this year, he previously led a highly successful transformation of Grundfos, a global water technology company. Before I dive in with questions, uh, our speakers all understand that given the size of this panel, we only have 45 minutes. Uh, we're going to try to keep remarks concise and hopefully we can cover a lot of ground here. Um, Minister Schmidt, uh, first, I know that you'll have to leave us a bit early, so I, but I want to really thank you for joining us. And I wanted to start with you, as I know um, you wanted to really be a part of this discussion. As Chile's environment minister, uh, you've been at the forefront of global conversations on how governments and co corporations can and should cooperate. In important ways, government sets the context for business. How do you intend to change that context through the incentives you set and how you cooperate with industry? Well, thank you, Rick. Uh, thank you for the invitation and uh, congratulations to all of you, you know, making so much to push forward to really fight climate change, which is the I guess it's a bigger global ethical uh, imperative that we have today. First of all, I want to start saying that global warming is a fight that have two equal urgent fronts. One is mitigation by decarbonizing our economies. And just as an important is adaptation, reducing the vulnerability of our communities, territories, and infrastructure. And both mitigation and adaptation are fully connected. Today, thanks to the science, we have one universal target for emission reductions that all countries, companies, and non-state actors must work towards a net zero by 2050 at the latest. Governments have, you know, a big importance in that. That's why we are promoting our uh, law of climate change and changing all our rules in order to accomplish that goal of carbon neutrality by 2050. A net zero goal requires all countries and sectors to reduce CO2 emissions as part of a broad circular economy agenda. Some sectors like electricity uh, can abate emissions easily and are already on a good track. But other sectors like aviation, shipping, trucking, steel, cement, face bigger challenges when reducing CO2 emissions because direct electrification is technically not viable or too expensive. Green hydrogen is a solution for those hard to abate sectors. In particular, sectors like shipping, heavy duty, tracking, and intercontinental aviation. Hydrogen can meet energy needs given its unique high energy density and transportability attributes. This is why uh, in 2020, the high level champions of Chile and UK with seven leading companies launched the Green Hydrogen Catapult Initiative by you know, to deploy 25 gigawatts of green hydrogen by 2026. A sign of confidence in the supply base ability to scale up and reduce the cost of this in the short term. Chile is preparing the condition to be, you know, some of these 25 gigawatts uh, to be developed in our country. We already established our national green hydrogen strategy together with the private sector to make Chile the cheapest green hydrogen generator by 2030 and one of the top three exported in the world, helping to accelerate the introduction of renewable energies in all sectors. 
As Ellen MacArthur Foundation properly highlights, switching to renewable energy could reduce emissions in 55%, but the other 45% can only be tackled by changing the way we produce and the way we use and consume products. If the world creates a circular economy for just the key uh, five sectors, cement, aluminum, steel, plastics, and food, we could cut CO2 emission by 3.7 million tons by 2050, equivalent to eliminate all the current emissions from the transport. In Chile, the implementation of the circular economy to only one sector, to the construction center, will translate into $315 million in savings every year and reduce 35% of all our waste we generate annually. We know that climate risk is investment risk, but we also believe that climate transition presents a historic investment opportunity. There is no company whose business model won't be profoundly affected by the transition to a net zero economy. Innovation is key and we must help that to happen. As you know, electromobility plays a very important role in the transformation process to a low emission economy. But it's also in our country a clear example of how innovation in a business model can make big changes and accelerate transformations. Although the initial cost of the electric buses is higher than the combustion buses, the opera operational cost is much lower. Innovation in the business model to finance the change to electromobility with the operation cost reduction help Chile to promote electromobility, making Santiago today the city with most electric buses in the world out of China. We have to eradicate the myth that taking care of the environment and economic growth are opposed. Quite the opposite. In Chile, we promote the issue of green sovereign bonds with the highest international certification from the CBI, the Climate Bond Initiative, obtaining the best rate that Chile has ever achieved with the issue of a sovereign bond. Reaching carbon neutrality brings important social, environmental and economic benefits. In Chile, it requires an investment around $45 billion, but brings net economic benefit directly of more than 30 million billion dollars that multiplied by five if you add all the indirect economic benefits. Furthermore, uh, as indicated by the World Bank, reaching carbon neutrality will increase Chile GDP by 4.4 percent by 2050. Well, colleagues, today we are facing difficult times with the COVID-19. We were talking this before. But this shows us clearly that we are more connected than we ever expected, everybody of that. So now the international community, together with the states, the private sector, must work together to foster a green recovery, invest substantially, accelerating the action to reduce emission and to strengthen adaptation and resilience as the base of a sustainable development. Transformation is already here. We must join forces. As you say, this is a mission possible partnership that we can, you know, work together. In this spirit, I'm happy to invite you all to join the Climate Ambition Alliance for Carbon Neutrality by 2050. This is the first alliance that put together countries with non-state actors, with, you know, investors, with business and local governments committed to carbon neutrality by 2050 at the latest. All working together help us to, you know, really accelerate this enormous challenge that we have ahead. We can do it uh, together and you can count on Chile for that. Great. Uh, no. That's a wonderful set of ambitions, both for the country and for the world that you've outlined. I know you have to go very soon, but can I just ask you one quick question, which is given the kind of ambition you have and the emphasis on innovation, what do you feel like you need most from the private sector in order to appropriately set the right agenda and the right policies? Well, I think that 
when the private sector understands that they are part of the solution and not part of the problem, things change a lot. At uh, the beginning was a lot of resistance uh, because it was the belief that this will bring a lot of costs that are kind of crazy things, especially for countries like Chile that is a small amateur, uh, but we are very you know, uh, affected by climate change. In the way that you understand two things, that mitigation and adaptation come, comes together. It's not this difference that we're making all the time. They come very together. Business will not be able to uh, continue the same path they were having before. They need to make transformations. And these transformations are you know, vital for the sustainability of their business. And there's opportunity there to make these changes. The, uh, for example, the energy sector in Chile was a leader in that, in changing, in understanding their part of the solution and not part of the problem. And they accelerate their transformation strongly. Now they're a leading uh, business and they are very welcome by the communities. Instead, other sectors that still think they are part of the problem, you, you know, you need to work with them to show them there is a solution. So, for example, the development of green hydrogen has, you know, bring another sectors into the table that now see an opportunity there to change, especially mining sector, that is a very important sector in our country. They were feeling a little, a little bit um, attacked by the changes. Now it feels that they can also lead the changes and became a very important sector and start exporting, for example, green copper, that is one of the main products of our, of our country. So when they understand that they can be part of the solution, uh, there, you know, things change a lot. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm gonna now shift uh, Maria to you uh, and your role in We Mean Business and the championship you've provided to the mission possible partnership. Um, could you expand on the multi-stakeholder collaboration points the minister just raised? There are several organizations and coalitions devoted to fighting climate change. How do you see Mission Possible Partnerships distinct reason for being, and why is the partnership dif differentiated in its ability to drive change against such an ambitious and important agenda? Thanks. Thank you very much, Rich and Anthony and Carolina for the for the great uh, opening remarks. Certainly, when Winning Business Coalition joined the Mission Possible Partnership, we did it because clearly we think that this is the best show in town, and we need to align efforts, and we are much stronger together. So, together with the four partners, um, plus the 15 of our organizations that we are working with, we're bringing already 300 companies uh, to the partnership. We think we need to raise the challenge. Uh, we also agree with uh, Minister Caroline that um, renewables and electric vehicles are going well, uh, much faster than what we had expected, and that's great. This morning we had the great news that in Europe, uh, renewable energy generation has been uh, bigger than fossil fuel generation in the year 2020. Fantastic news. But we know that on the how to abate things are going a bit slower and we want to supercharge efforts so that those sectors are on track because we need to be net zero by 2050, we need to have emissions by 2030. So we invite the companies to join and today we're very pleased to launch the partnership. Why do we need the Mission Possible Partnership? Well, those uh, how to abate sectors, they represent 30% and they are the most difficult, but possible to abate. And that was well demonstrated uh, by the report that was published a few years ago. We are working with the uh, key and very difficult uh, sectors in transport, shipping, uh, trucking, and aviation. Plus on the material side with aluminium, chemicals, cement, and steel. And we think uh, we bring a differentiated approach uh, because we're not only working with corporates, but we also bring in the demand from the sectors. As Rich rightly says, so the scope three emissions is a large part of the emissions of many of the companies that have committed to net zero. And they look at the sectors that we have included in Mission Possible Partnership because we need to accelerate the decarbonization and the demand signal 
it can play a critical role. The banks and the investment community as well, and nevertheless the governments with the R&D and public procurement are a key factor, and that's why I'm very pleased also to partner with the IEA to bring this forward. So corporates on these sectors are going to have a very clear signal from the market that they need to innovate, that they need to bring emission reductions in their products because there's going to be a scale, a demand on their ecosystem that is going to ask for those projects. I think we can drive change. We can drive change. Winning Business works with 2,000 companies. One of the initiatives that we support is the Science-Based Targets Initiative that has today 1,200 companies that have committed to Paris Align targets. So the companies uh, have committed to these targets and now they need to move to actions. And I'm supporting this. We have 70% of the world economy that now has a net zero target. So the signal is clear. Now we need to accelerate and supercharge efforts as I said before. I think Rich, I can't hear. You. I think you might be on mute. Yes, yes, I apologize. Uh, it's a, uh, I've done it so many times, and I still somehow still do it. Uh, the the you've outlined such a bold set of ambitions around this. Um, what's your goal for this year? Like, how are you looking at 2021 in the context of Mission Possible and and what it can achieve um, in a relatively short time frame? Yes. So it is a short time frame, but uh, the group has been working for the past couple of years. So they started with 30 companies. Now there are 300 companies, of which many uh, belong to the, to the group, the high-level uh, CEO group uh, hosted by WEF. Uh, the high-level champions have announced 20 initiatives that they want uh, to see uh, come with very ambitious pathways at, in Glasgow. We want to bring seven of them in the sectors that I mentioned before. And to do so, we have a very clear uh, roadmap that we want to apply to all of them. Some will go faster because they have done a lot of work before, others will have to catch up. But first, we need to mobilize the companies, the ones with highest, at the highest levels of ambition. Then the companies need to agree on that net zero vision and pathway, and then they need to commit to actions, both in terms of emission targets, demand signals, climate-aligned finance, or government R&D and procurement. And finally, the, the last step, we want to support the implementation with the creation of, of different levels, standards, tools, guidelines, and metrics. Uh, a big ambition that I think, um, I don't think we have a choice, and in some form, you know, if we draw a parallel with what is happening with COVID, what we're trying to, to do here is to build the vaccines for climate change. And we need to have the systems, both the technologies, but also the infrastructure to deploy them in the next decade. Great. Well, it's a critical set of aspirations and I think appropriately bold ambitions for what we can achieve. And uh, it does feel like we're really on a good momentum path. Fatih, I wanted to turn it uh, to you. Uh, you've recently stressed how critical innovation will be, uh, stating that about half of the emissions cut needed to put the world on a path to net zero by 2050 will need to come from technologies that are not on the market yet. Is it realistic to believe that the partnerships can get sectors, many of whom are fierce competitors, to collaborate on innovation and technology? And how do you see that working? Thank you very much, uh, Rich, for inviting the International Energy Agency to this important uh, meeting. Now, I would like to start by saying uh, uh, that the clean energy transition we all use is sometimes uh, mixed with the expression of clean electricity transition. So when we talk about the, everything is going well in the clean energy side, the examples are coming mainly from the solar and wind which are very good. We have recently crowned solar as the new king of electricity markets. It is becoming the cheapest source of uh, electricity generation across the world. Wind is growing as well. But these are happening in the power sector. And power sector today 
is responsible less than 40% of the emissions. More than 60% of the emissions, which are very stubborn, are coming from industry sector, transportation, buildings, and uh, others. And the, let's take transportation. My dear colleague, uh, Maria Mantuluce mentioned electric cars are breaking records. Completely true in Europe and elsewhere. But let me put it in a context. 2020, electric car sales broke a record, their own record, which meant of the, all the car sales in the world, 3% of the, all the cars were electric cars, 42% were SUVs going in the opposite direction, okay? Uh, emitting uh, more than 30% uh, more emissions uh, compared to average uh, uh, car. So uh, not an easy task. Industry sector, uh, the, uh, Mrs. Schmidt mentioned uh, the um, iron steel. Iron steel, yes, cement, petrochemicals, they are making huge amount of emissions around the world, especially in Asia. And most of those facilities are very young. You cannot shut them down immediately before they finish their economic uh, lifetime. And uh, they are, uh, we will need, the world need iron, steel, cement, petrochemical years to come. Urbanization, Africa is growing very strongly, population, India and the others. So how we are going to decarbonize outside of uh, power sector, and I should make a footnote here, our work in the power sector is not finished yet. We are just in the beginning. But how we decarbonize is a critical question. As you mentioned, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, we made a study. We said, we reduced the emissions to net zero 2050. How many percent of these emission reductions can come from the existing proven technologies if we push them strongly? And how much is the left? What we found out is that about 50% of the emission reductions to reach net 2050, net zero in 2050, need to come from technologies which are only in the demonstration phase or in the laboratories now. Therefore, key question, innovation, and innovation in the so-called stubborn, hard to abate sectors transportation, industry, and uh, buildings. So in my view, we are at the IEA. We believe that the energy markets are best governed by the, rule, by the rules of the market principles, by competition. But I believe in this case, it's an urgent case, and we need tremendous Herculean efforts around the world there is a specific role for the governments to play. Governments need to be in the driving seat. Couple of examples. One, I mentioned innovation. How will the innovation happen? It will not happen before because we give such strong speeches, sent very, uh, very sharp uh, tweets and so on. Innovation will happen if the R&D, research and development spending increases in clean energy. We have the data. In the last 10 years, R&D for clean energy investments didn't move one millimeter. Stable. In nominal terms, uh, stable. And when you look at the other technologies, IT sector, man car manufacturing, the R&D uh, expenses are increasing. So governments, if they take the climate change seriously, a lot of money needs to go R&D in terms of uh, the clean energy. Second, government-private cooperation. We all talk about this, but the government leadership here, in terms of providing incentives to private sector for innovation, is critical. 
We love the private sector, but we all know that the private sector, when they are built, a key target is making profits. There is nothing wrong with that. It is their job. But governments need to make sure that they make the profit by putting the money in the right place, right place for the climate. So this is the second point. Third point, and the last one, international collaboration. It is extremely critical that we learn from each other what to do, which examples are good, and also which examples are not good, to learn from each other and create uh, synergies. And I am very happy to see that there is a momentum now coming around the world, and I hope that this momentum will go beyond setting targets and turning into real action. And are you so in this context, uh, 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 last two uh, uh, points, we are at the IEA, we are preparing world's first roadmap for 2050. What does it mean for the energy sector year by year need to be done? How much investment, which source of financing for offshore wind, for hydrogen, for efficiency? We are preparing and we are going to release on 18th of May and we are very happy to support this uh, mission possible initiative by providing data, suggestion, advice, and building the governments we are working from China to United States, from Canada to India, together with the uh, private sector. I believe right competition, fierce competition, but the right competition in the right framework will help everybody to uh, uh, make a sustainable future for governments, for companies, and for the citizens of the world. And IEA is very determined to lead the global clean energy transitions. Thank you. Thank you, Pati. And I think the roadmap you're producing, I'm sure, will be a really important uh, contributor on that journey. I'm conscious of the time, and we have two panelists that I haven't uh, gotten to yet. So I'm going to shift now, uh, Puneet, to you. Uh, as someone who lives in a hard to abate world, uh, you've helped Dalmia to integrate successful sustainability practices. Are you optimistic or pessimistic about the mission possible partnership and what role it can play to help uh, sectors move faster right now? So, Rich, first of all, I'm delighted to be here uh, on this very important platform uh, at the beginning of the first month of 2021. Uh, with a very ambitious goal. So I would say to your question that I'm cautiously optimistic. Um, first of all, I think uh, ETC has prepared a very detailed and well-researched blueprint for seven sectors which generate almost a third of the world's CO2. And I think that is a great start. I also see tremendous urgency in corporates, in policymakers, as well as financiers to ensure that this is serious stuff and, uh, you know, incentives and disincentives are given to, uh, are created so that people behave in a certain way and um, uh, targets that are being set either by countries, um, you know, um, or by associations are being met. So I see a sense of urgency. I also see that World Economic Forum provides a very credible and a neutral platform to unify people uh, who are corporates who are fierce competitors, um, policymakers and financiers and even consumers. So I think there is a neutral platform which can create faster momentum uh, in these dialogues and create you know, possible solutions. So overall, I would say ETC has a detailed blueprint. I see a sense of urgency in various stakeholders and World Economic Forum. This Mission Possible platform is a very neutral and a credible platform to increase momentum of dialogue and possible solutions. That's why I'm optimistic. Uh, at Dalmia, we are determined to play our role. Um, we have already announced that we will be carbon negative by 2040. Uh, we are the first company globally to commit to RE100 and EP100 targets. And we are also a part of UN leadership group 
for net zero uh, heavy industry transition. So I think um, we are very keen and very excited to play a role um, with the World Economic Forum on the Mission Possible platform uh, in the run up to Glasgow to ensure that uh, you know we take some really specific and um, uh, targeted projects which can be showcased and which can be which can demonstrate that you know this can work. And I'll be I'll I'll talk more about it. So I think overall I'm optimistic, but I'm cautious because I think uh, ambition of this scale requires some real operational work. And I think what is required is to create some showcase projects which can be used to show that green is profitable. It is not a cost, but you can actually improve your uh, you know value creation for your investors and you can also improve profitability. And I want to talk about one of these projects which we are working on. We are working on a carbon capture project with Asian Development Bank. They are already uh, studying this project and the first report will be out by February uh, of 2021. I think based on that, we are you know, looking forward on, we will invest and we're also looking forward to some clean tech funds which could possibly participate in this bankable project. And if this uh, you know, works, it will absorb 55% of the CO2 which is produced in every cement plant. 45% will still be, uh, you know, we have to think through what to do, but at least more than half of the CO2 which is emitted can be absorbed by this project. So we are very excited to showcase, uh, you know, a project like this in the run up to Glasgow. And I'm hoping that, you know, we can do more such projects in each of the seven industries in the run up to Glasgow and show that ultimately green is profitable. And we have seen in the solar energy sector that capex in the last 10 years is down from uh, 12 crore a megawatt to 4 crore, which is down by 70%. And the opex of solar energy is down by 90%. Same has happened in LED bulbs, where the cost of an LED bulb is down by 90%. So I think if such projects can get traction, I think the cost of such projects with scale can also come down dramatically and which can further help in adoption. So I think I'm optimistic, but I would like to see some demonstrable marquee projects in the run up to Glasgow, which can be adopted in each of these seven sectors and hopefully make an impact in this year itself. Great. I really resonate, and you actually provided a wonderful lead-in for our last panelist. Uh, Mads, first of all, congratulations on taking on the CEO role uh, of Orsted. It's just such a great company. Uh, from the perspective of a renewable energy player, does this all resonate? What's your, how do you feel like you're linking into the Mission Possible partnership, given that you're not really in one of the hard-to-abate sectors? Yeah, ab absolutely, uh, absolutely. It, it it all resonates incredibly well, and and I think it's it's not only an opportunity; it's it's an obligation for us to engage with these hard to abate sectors. Our our vision as a company is a is a world that runs entirely on green energy, and uh, as a company ourselves, we've already made a transition from 100 almost 100 percent fossil fuels to now 90 percent. And we will, by 2025, be the first major energy company in the world who runs entirely, uh, is entirely carbon neutral in our energy generation. But, but that's not enough. Exactly like both the minister and Fatih Birol said, the, uh, the, the electricity, the power sector is going reasonably well. I would give the caveat that it is still not going fast enough. We are not moving fast enough still. But it's going reasonably well. And the fact is that one of the major levers for any hard to abate sector is still fueled by renewable energy. The minister talked about green hydrogen. That is certainly one, but also further up the value chain, how do you create e-fuels from renewable power into aviation, into, into the sort of the, the, the high temperature processes in industry, into heavy transport? That's why we as a company, we are not only continuing to roll out more renewable energy generation, we are engaging heavily into actually already now four of the seven sectors in the Mission Possible Partnerships, where we engage ourselves in the working group to create those solutions. Uh, it is, it's very clear that we can't wait 
until the power sector has made the full transition to renewable. We need to have parallel tracks and, and action that is too slow is a failure. So I think as we hopefully accelerate the renewable energy generation, not only we at Orsted, but the entire power sector globally, we need to in parallel significantly lean in to the hard to abate sectors to create innovative and not least scalable solutions. Because like, for example, offshore wind, that has only been possible through lawmakers and, and uh, governments leaning, leaning into creating the early incentives to make this profitable for companies to get started. Same thing is needed for green hydrogen. Right now, it's hopelessly uncompetitive. That competitiveness and price will come with scale. And that is why the sectors need to come together. But the lawmakers also need to create, for at least for the next decade or so, the economic realities for us to, to make that happen. We are leaning in both into the steel sector. We are, do have partnerships already on green hydrogen with companies like BP on one of their refineries with Yara, the world's largest ammonia producer, and, and many other harder to abate sectors. And, and we are ready to lean in and we encourage all energy companies around the world to do the same. I will, I'll just finish up by saying two, saying two things. We, we need to, in a world that unfortunately has been somewhat more polarized in the last years, we need to both at a national level, but also at a company level to think much more structurally together into ecosystems, which is why I think the mission possible partnerships by taking a global sector approach in collaboration with governments to ensure that we don't fall into the ever sort of the excuse we always hear where we can't do it because it'll hurt our international competitiveness. With this approach and with the cross-sector collaboration, we can remove that excuse and we can and will move forward. And I will make a small final promotional break. The climate partnerships that have happened to, to, to achieve the 70% 2030 emissions reduction tar uh, target in Denmark my home country, which is a rounding area in terms of global emissions. But I will say that the approach of cross-sector collaboration and very tight collaboration between governments and companies is something I believe can and should be scaled globally. It will be difficult, but it's doable. And that's why, like other panelists here, I'm an optimist, but it's going to take that we do away with the selfishness, both at a national, national and at a company level. Great. Well, I'm very conscious that we run on time in, in, the, in the WEF world and we're almost out now. Uh, I'll take just one minute and say I'm so energized by the progress I see happening in the coalitions that are being built in the ways different industries are coming together within their industries and across uh, the mission possible partnership. What's going on now to me is just a critical element of that journey, because if we can make progress in these seven sectors, I think what Fatih said is really important. Renewable power is unbelievably important, but we've got to be able to go after these hard to abate vectors. And I think what we heard here from very different vantage points, the role that governments can play to spur this, the role of innovation, the power of industry leaders, including the two great CEOs represented here to be helping to provide examples and real life demonstrations of what can be done, that when you put those elements together, you really can start to make progress. So I just want to thank all of you for joining this, for contributing to such a rich discussion, and more importantly, to the whole Mission Possible Partnership to wish you tremendous success, both in this year leading up to COP26, but far beyond, because it will make a big difference for all of us. So thanks to everyone for joining us. It was great to have you here. Bye-bye.